the Soviet space program. Now, I don't think I'll have time to talk about this later, and I simply can't resist. If you ever wanted a window into the contours of the Russian mind, the Soviet space program will explain everything. Thanks to one authentic goddamn genius, a man called Sergei Korolev, who died relatively unknown in his own land, Soviet rocket technology leapt ahead of the West during the late 1950s. Korolev was responsible for the R-7 rocket, an almost otherworldly looking machine that has proven to be of such sound design, it is still used by the Soyuz program to this very day. While the American space program was taking its sweet time, being greatly concerned with things like rocket safety, and whether its missions would be scientifically productive, the Russians just started fucking launching things willy-nilly into the sky. But Boris, where will rocket pieces land? Who gives a shit? Just go! This difference in approach is essentially the reason the Russians routinely beat the West to several important milestones. In 1957, they launched a metal volleyball into space called Sputnik. All the damn thing did was beep incessantly, but it caused the United States to just about wet its pants. I remember I was there. And I did used to have that problem, yes. Their next effort was called Sputnik 2, an even bigger metal volleyball into which they shoved a dog named Laker, who became the first Earthling to travel into outer space and subsequently the first Earthling to, um, die in outer space. But Boris, how does dog come down? Who cares? In 1961, we come to manned space flight. Again, the Americans were burning the candle at both ends to design a spacecraft that could be fully controlled by an astronaut pilot, while the Soviets just grabbed a fucking trash can, stuck some coat hangers onto it, and called it a day. This was the Vostok program. Now, everyone knows Yuri Gagarin was the first man into outer space, but more importantly, he was also the first man to come down from outer space. Unlike the fastidious Americans who insisted their spacecraft land at a pre-designated spot in the ocean, nobody really knew where the hell these Vostok things were going to go. And they didn't splash gently into the ocean either. During Vostok 1, Yuri Gagarin was given only a parachute and a hearty pat on the back. After re-entering the atmosphere, this brave son of a bitch had to... <laughs> After re-entering the atmosphere, this brave son of a bitch had to blow open the hatch, climb out of the... <laughs> climb out of the tumbling thing and jump for his life. Thankfully, his chute deployed and Yuri landed in the middle of a field someplace. Meanwhile, the Vostok capsule dropped like a meteor, bounced into another field, and scared the shit out of some local farm girls. Yuri then walked for several miles, dragging his parachute behind him to find a... P <laughs> to find a payphone to call Moscow. But all's well that ends well, and I suppose Yuri Gagarin deserves his place in the history books. Among other things, he began the long-standing cosmonaut tradition of pissing on the rocket just before getting into it. Valentina Tereshkova, the first woman into space, was given a pass on this tradition, but she insisted, pulled down her spacesuit, and also pissed on the rocket. I tell you, if looks could kill. But my favorite story from the annals of Soviet space exploration is the story of the Venera program. And in the 50 minutes it operated on the surface, it took this one photograph. And that's it. That's the only picture there is of Venus. Oh, wait a minute. There was one other one. Wow. What amazing pictures. Now, I'm not going to pretend the American space program didn't have its share of disasters or setbacks, but there's something about the wild insanity of the Soviet space program that I find distinctly revealing. If a corner can be cut, you better believe a Russian is going to cut it. <laughs>